do have, I think, a substantial business we've built or, you know, studio business that we've built around this. And we run it more like an art studio than a manufacturer of audio equipment. But I kind of broke this promise to myself to not do this professionally when, uh, you know, friends of mine started inquiring about commissioning things that would allow me to build on a scale that I couldn't otherwise build. So my first commissions were uh, a very close friend and kind of mentor uh, who has a, a who who started a chain of hotels called the Ace Hotel. He is also unfortunately deceased now, but wow. he was um, instrumental in making in bridging that, like taking this thing that was, he knew that I was doing this as a hobby, and he was like, "This is dope. Like, you know, how can I? I, I want I want in. Like, what can we do?" So my first commission was building a big 16-inch broadcast turntable for the Ace Hotel when it opened in New York. And it still sits there. That was sometime in the late 2000s. It's in the Flatiron District, just north of Madison Park. And, you know, then I, I started um, doing commissions, few private commissions. I started working with another group of very close friends. I have a brand called Saturdays. Uh, and they were opening a lot of stores in Japan. So I was building speaker systems that we would ship to their Japanese um, stores and that was kind of the beginning of a cool sort of like full circle thing where like I was learning from the Japanese audiophile scene and then kind of getting recognition within Japan for some of the stuff I was building then um, this very influential brand called Supreme who I also have a lot of history with and have really deep relationships with a lot of people there um, and you know have kind of always considered part of my peer community asked me to start doing uh, sound systems for all of their stores. Uh, and around the same time, actually in the same run of speakers that I built for the first Supreme store, I overproduced and Virgil bought a pair for his home. Virgil was already very influential, but he was nowhere near as influential as he is today, uh, you know. Um, and we started collaborating just through, I, I, again, I really wanted nothing to do with clothing or graphics, or I really wanted to dedicate myself to this. And if I needed to make money to support this, do that through things that were maybe a little less creative, but more lucrative. I hadn't figured out like a lot of these guys now have that you can actually make a very good career out of doing things that I was originally passionate about. Is that, so, is that Nam de Guerre? Nom de Guerre, by this time, we had already closed Nom de Guerre. But yes, Nom de Guerre was, is often credited as being quite influential, and he, and Virgil always cites Nom de Guerre as being one of the most important influences on his uh, vision for what like a clothing brand could be. He often, re uh, he often references Nom de Guerre as being like the first place where he saw this bridge between streetwear and high-end men's clothing. So is, we had is, stopped is what doing you're that. wearing, is that Nom de Guerre? No, this is my wife made this actually. Um, oh. She has a small brand called Casa Maria. Yeah, so Nom de Guerre we stopped doing in 2010. And then uh, I wanted nothing to do with the industry really. And but Virgil through kind of like soft, gently pulling me, got me to collaborate, uh, do, do a whole collaboration on his first women's wear collection, which was within a year or so of his appointment at Louis Vuitton. So I, I was his collaborator on his first women's collection th through graphics and some ideas. And, um, and then pretty much the next season after that was when he was announced as the artistic director of Louis Vuitton for Men. And then it was just like a rocket ship, you know? I mean, it was a very surreal experience. Um, and, you know, he brought me along for that ride. To answer your question, I think that I build this stuff for myself and it naturally resonates with like-minded people. And then, yeah, I do have also quite a few like influential customers. And uh, I mean, you know, I've never spent a dollar on marketing or advertising or uh, or anything like that. But yeah, I mean, this kind of experience, you know, it's like, I guess I'm very like unprofessional in my presentation because having a dialogue and just like uh, 
hang out and listen to music with people is really what I'm driven to do. And, you know, people will come over here and I won't even realize that, like, I didn't play them anything that's, like, commercialized. You know, I mean, I run this tweeter right now, this vintage Pioneer PTR9 beryllium ribbon tweeter. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I run a lot of components and use them in my commission builds that, you know, you'd never build a brand on using because I have to source a lot of the stuff from vintage parts. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just keep kind of keep going with like whatever's inspiring me and I'm just really, really fortunate that people keep supporting it. You and, and trying to do things in my own way and kind of like develop my own voice through that process. Like right now, another big thing that I've been working on is um, like parting out techniques direct drive turntables because I love the techniques direct drive system. So the turntable we're listening to this morning, you probably didn't even recognize. It looks more like a, you know a plinth Garrard or Lenko, but that's actually a techniques direct drive motor in that plinth. And in wood plinthing it, you get a lot of the same benefits that you get out of a high mass wood plinth for a noisy idler drive turntable like a Garrard 301. The Technique doesn't have the same noise issues uh, an idler drive has, but um, you know, through high mass, you reduce rumble and feedback and motor noise, um, but you can also then mount arms, all these beautiful 12 inch arms the same way you would on a, on a Garrard. I, I have been plinting these turntables for as long as I've been doing this hobby. This specific Garrard 301, I think I built, um, I don't know, close to 15, probably about 15 years ago. And I love the Garrard 301, but it is also very problematic. I mean, there's a whole industry of experts that have built businesses around trying to overcome the challenges. And there's a beautiful sound of a Garrard 301 that's very, uh, specific and, and, and kind of trademarked. Uh, but the thing that I really fell in love with in working with this kind of turntable building is tone arms. Tone arms, there are so many beautiful tone arms from the Orophon, the SME 3012, 12 inch version of the SME arm. Uh, and now there are a bunch of um, amazing tone arm manufacturers. But yeah, you know, there, you know, there are these, all these arms that everyone from Frank Schroeder or Thomas Schick or this new, new uh, Groove Master arm or I mean there are there are a lot of 12 inch arms that um, are being manufactured now and are beautiful but you know if you want to run one of these arms you need TD124 or uh, you know Plinth Gerard or Lenko or you know any any arm that will accept some kind of arm board for a 12 inch arm but that's not typically like anything techniques except for maybe a SP10. Right. Um, so I've been working on on developing uh, some uh, kind of mounting accessories that allow you to like extract motors from the techniques turntables or even order them as spare parts and you know uh, put them on some kind of mounting plate that then makes them something that you can put into a wood plinth like the rest of these turntables. Really fun. You said in, you said some really amazing, interesting things that speak to your history. Uh, in Steve's interview, you called your products a wellness product, a sound bath. You referred to this as my audio practice, almost music as therapy. And you also mentioned that you think of listening to music as ritualistic and a hi-fi as a shrine. What do you mean by those comments? I mean, I think a lot of that, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I borrowed the shrine thing from Herb, from some early sound practices uh, column he did. Uh, I think it was some article where he mentioned, like, you should build yourself a shrine to music. And, um, you know, I mean, that's like what we do as audiophiles, right? Like, if you want to sit down um, with, with like real intention and focus and, and listen to music, like you're looking 
I mean, what I'm not looking for when I sit down to listen to music is being highly analytical. You know, I mean, there are people who listen to music that way, and um, you know, when they sit down to listen to music, they're sitting and it's more of like almost a critical kind of practice than one of uh, appreciation. Um, but yeah, I mean, I sit down to listen to music to kind of like equalize my 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 brain waves, my mood. You know, like I want music to make me feel. You know, I don't want to like be doing some kind of calculation in my head when I'm listening to music. I don't want to be uh, like overly analytical of of my equipment, of the recording. I mean, there are people who that's that, that's what attracts them to it. I want to have an experience with music that's like hopefully transformative. For me, like this system and sitting and listening to it is one of the most important things I do in my in my life. I've heard it practice because it's kind of for me, like I'm, you know, I grew up with meditation, like I said. Um, and you know, I did grow up with like twice a day, sit down for a specific amount of time and meditate. I now find this kind of practice to be settling in a, in a similar way. You know, you can, um, it's a way to just like kind of hopefully not be distracted by work or personal stuff and just really kind of try to tap into like the consciousness of the players on the record or the intention of the artists that made the record and appreciate it in a way that requires your full attention. Every audio file's goal, and you spelled it out so well, and the system is, the little bit I've heard is surprisingly relaxed. I didn't expect that, as I said, with these horns. Um, it's really something. Tell me about um, Mr. Koji Wakabayashi's system. What was listening to his system like? How did that make you feel when you heard it for the first time? I think I think a lot of um, my experiences traveling and listening to, or I wouldn't even say listening to other people's systems, it's more experiencing their audio, you know, practice, as I say, but um, just kind of going and, and like experiencing Koji's whole lifestyle. Um, it was a very important experience for me because Koji, as a lot of audiophiles in Japan do, um, I mean, it is his life. He lives in a warehouse full of large scale pro audio gear from the 1920s through the 1990s. And then you also were inspired by Maison de la Audiophile in Paris. Now, is that the... Herb has written about this thing in, in France. It's like underground scene. Is this the same thing? Um, not exactly. I did go to the thing that you're referring to this year. It's called European Triad Fest. ET ETF, as people call it. Um, which is really cool. Um, and it's another... I mean, it's probably the biggest gathering of like-minded audiophiles I've ever, I've ever been to. It's a really special thing because it's totally non-commercial and they vet all of the participants. Um, so you have to be invited uh, and it's very explicitly non-commercial. So like you can't go there with the intention of selling anything. You have to go there to exchange ideas and uh, and experience the experimenting of some of the other participants. I think there are maybe roughly 200 or so members of this group around the world. Some of the, um, some of the participants will bring like a car trailer full of like stuff. Um, and then there are like, they kind of, well, it moves every three years but it's in a small medieval village this last year and it's like 
Um, the guy who organizes it, Tim Gurney, who's a very, very well-known uh, builder of Western Electric horns, he secured like the sort of town center, like town square building, which is the main place. And then there were like maybe seven or so satellite rooms within a few blocks of that in this little village on the hill. And, um, and yeah, so there are like different groups that come and set up different, like the Danish guys will set up one room and those guys are pretty amazing. They'll bring like a whole lab and start building amps like on site, modifying things, trying things. Wow. Uh, and that room had one of Tim's uh, uh, Western Electric 13A horns in it. And then um, there was a, a area called the Salt Cellar that Herb wrote about in uh, Gramophone Dreams column. And the salt cellar uh, had a few systems set up in it. One of them by my now friend Martina Schoner, uh, who is an amazing, uh, amazing audiophile and engineer, turntable tuning expert. Female? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's amazing. Oh, wow. She's super inspiring. She's worked for Thorin's. She helped develop one iteration of the Garage 501. She makes a, a upgraded power supply for the Garage's. She's an amazing, she's a, one of the top phonograph tuning people in the world. Uh, and then the main system, uh, I don't know exactly, it was a, it was a many people contributed to, but um, Frank Schroeder brought a turntable with a very, very know, unusual, amazing, hard to make arm that he's been making. I mean, they're very funny about even like talking about this stuff. So I don't even really know how much, but yeah, I think, uh, Another guy, Holger Barsk, brought some big horns for that room. And then there's a group called uh, Melodia, French audiophile forum and group that set up another room with two different systems in it. And it's just like sharing, you know? And then you also deal with Great Plains Audio in some capacity? Yeah. Bill at GPA, he builds all of the Alltech replica drivers that I use in the bigger builds, you know, like this stuff. Um, and the story of GPA is another one that really needs to be, uh, kind of protected because they are the, uh, they hold all of the, the tooling and IP from Altec Pro. That's the guy you were speaking about earlier. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredible story, but you know, he was running, uh, a factory for Altec when, um, they were eventually acquired and the... The, uh, the new parent company wanted to like divest of Pro Audio. Um, they essentially uh, gave Bill the entire, everything from like the, you know, hand-drawn design drawings and schematics and marketing materials and test equipment and dyes, tooling to continue manufacturing the drivers. So he's been keeping this lineage alive since uh, late 90s. Um, and yeah, I mean, he used to, um, I've been buying drivers from him forever. Uh, and he, I'd say, I don't know, uh, five or six years ago, uh, when I started ordering things in larger quantities for various reasons, he said, I'll just, I'd rather just do this as a sort of an OEM thing and, you know, you can, you can brand it, but I'll build it for you. So, um, that's how I kind of ended up with these, oh, just branded Alltech replica drivers. They're all built by Bill. Wow. In Oklahoma City. And tell me about this new 31.5 inch super sub. I mean, who is that for? <laughs> it's incredibly big. Man, um, you know, I dedicated myself to really like for probably a decade, the classic Alltech two-way speakers, which are really beautiful sounding as you've heard, but fairly limited in their bandwidth. Um, so you don't get a lot of very deep bass or very high highs. Um, but there's, an incredible amount of um, 
dynamics and tone in the mid range that you got. I mean, it's a, it's a, it was a mid range study for like a decade. And then I, and especially in installing them in public spaces, started experimenting with subs and super tweeters. Uh, it's a super woofer. So this is a super, this is literally, it's made by Falstax in Japan and it's called the super woofer. Um, and it's something that like in these issues of MJ that have these featured sound rooms, they will, uh, you know, you, you see the super woofer very frequently in these really extreme audio room, listening rooms in Japan. And I always want, to, I've heard them a few times, they're incredible. And I'd always wanted to build one. I didn't really think I could fit it in here and I'd pitch it to clients. And I think like on paper, it's just too extreme. They're just like, this is cool, but you know, no, let's do a smaller sub. Um, but I, I really wanted to make it part of my sort of like system and uh, I figured out that I could fit it in here and I also kind of assumed that once I built it and put it in here I was going to then have more interested clients that wanted me to build stuff around it for them. You just hear music down into you know usable uh, very low frequency um, you know it it has usable content down in the high teens. Um, but you don't hear like an annoying subwoofer, you know? I mean, you can play, it adds to every recording I play on it. Mm -hmm. 